Welcome to the NFL Max, the radio show inspired by the league founded in 1998, bringing you 20 plus years of fantasy football experience, broadcasting from our minds to your earbuds each and every week. We'll be breaking down player profiles with a long-term perspective for your teams and dynasty. And if you're listening on iTunes, you can watch the show on YouTube. YouTube.com backslash NFL Max. And if you're watching right now on YouTube, check us out on iTunes. Search in your podcast application, NFL Max, for your weekly Max fix. And we will also be giving away t shirts. So listen later on in the show for some details on how to get your free NFL Max t shirt. Let's just jump right into it. Uh, as always, Ewok Juggernauts here with the hot pineapples. And Nick, here we are. Uh, the marathon is almost over, and we've got one lap left to run. Championship week is finally here. Week 16, just days away. And um, I hope you're in the big game in some of your leagues. Um, you know, I'm one for 10, but I'm in there. Um, so what's up? How's it going? Uh, it's going pretty good. And uh, like you said, looking forward to championship week. I'm in uh, three championships um, you know, a lot of my leagues were, were taken under, uh, last year. So a lot of them are in the productive struggle stage where, you know, trying to get guys with some upside and have them bounce and, and, uh, you know, kind of develop a little bit. So I didn't expect, uh, many of, of my teams to make it to the championship this year, but I am in three. And so that's going to be exciting. You know, it's always fun week 16 to be sitting on the edge of your seat and, uh, you know, just that's that's what fantasy is all about, right? And that's what you don't get in those top scorer leagues. You're right. This is what it's all about. And um, we've been waiting all year for this. If you've been building your draft boards over the past 12 months, scouting players, doing your research. And if you're still listening to this podcast or any podcast right now, and you're a win away from winning your league, congratulations to you. Big ups for making it this far because it is not easy to do. You know, I'm in 10 leagues and I'm, I'm one out of 10. Nick is a few for 22, you said? Like yeah, 22. Sure. So it is not easy to do. And uh, you know what? No matter what happens this week, win or lose, getting to this spot and getting to week 16 um, is something that should be applauded. And you worked hard for it. Let's face it. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you are a diehard and you've been doing your thing for um, the past year now. So. Congratulations to the winners of week 15 and uh, for getting to this championship game. Um, what, a, what a bloodbath it was. What a bloodbath. It was. Week 15 was pff, ridiculous. I lost, um, I lost six semis. Six? Oh. Six. Six semis. That's a lot of semis. It's a semi two of which had Gurley. That's how bad how bad my teams were decimated. Wow. And Gurley yeah, still two, put up thirty two. plus in a PPR this week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, if you lost Week 15, you probably had a bunch of these guys. Uh, massive playoff killer disappointments. I'll just run quickly through the list here. It's incredible. Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, Cam Newton, Andrew Luck all stunk up the joint uh, for quarterbacks, running backs. It's hard to believe Saquon Barkley couldn't show up, especially with no OBJ. I was thinking they're going to funnel the offense through him all day. They just couldn't get him going. Saquon, Leonard Fournette, Aaron Jones with an injury, Sony Michelle, Philip Lindsay, Lamar Miller. And then you had your wide receivers. I had Keenan Allen in a bunch of leagues, put up a goose egg. Tyreek Hill dropped that touchdown, hit the ball, hit him in the helmet. Uh, Josh Gordon. Adam Thielen and your boy Amari Cooper and Corey Davis both didn't show up along with T.Y. Hilton and um, Gronkowski, Ertz, Ebron. I mean, it was really bad, really bad. For that's, that's what really killed me was uh, 
having, you know, a ton of Amari Cooper, a ton of Corey Davis, and I actually have a ton of Ebron too. I picked up a ton of stocks in the beginning of the year. Um, and so, you know, having those three plus Andrew Luck and probably a third of my leagues at quarterback, it was, it was a rough week. It was shocking to see this many top tier elite players just, you know, yeah. And a lot of those teams, you know, had Connor on them because I had Connor in 19 out of 22 leagues. So, you know, I have Connor in those leagues. He brings me to the semis pretty much with the bye weeks. And then, you know, he's not there for me. And then, you know, when it really counts. So it hurts, but that's fantasy, right? That's why you have a dynasty. That's why you build it out. Like for me, a lot of these teams, like I said, coming out of a startup, I thought was going to be a productive struggle. And I hit gold with Connor and a lot of them. And, you know, he carried me there. But then in the end, when he's out, you know, it's still a productive struggle team. I still got a way to go, um, you know, with a lot of these guys needing to grow and develop. And a lot of my teams were carried by Chubb and Connor. And so when Connor was out, I'm left with, you know, not too much in the saddle since I invested heavily at the top end with wide receivers. I guess you didn't have Jalen Samuels. I did not. I did not have Jalen Samuels, no. Yeah. I don't have many shares at all. Um, you know, I'm not a fan myself, but he was a hot wave rad. So let's talk about the players that the players that help you get to this point. And um, I guess we'll start off going to Minnesota and the uh Dolphins Vikings game where we saw the beginning of a new offense for Minnesota, the uh promotion of now offensive coordinator. Kevin Stefanski and the Vikings putting up 41 points on, you know, a putrid uh, Miami defense. But nonetheless, we got to see Dalvin Cook and Dalvin Cook looked incredible. And, you know, it makes you wonder what the heck were they doing uh, for the first 14 weeks of the season? And just pulling up his stats real quick, he had uh, 19 carries, 136 yards, two touchdowns. And even had a reception for 27 yards. But watching that game, you know, Dalvin Cook, for me, I've struggled with Dalvin Cook because I loved him in college as a prospect. And he had a a great collegiate career. And then he goes to the uh, combine and just face plants and has a horrific combine. So I bumped him down my boards as a rookie. And then um, he came out last year as a rookie and looked awesome. But then he battled with injuries, you know, multiple injuries again this year. But now he's finally healthy and we got to see what he could do. Uh, I mean, granted, it's against the horrible uh, Dolphins defense. But uh, thoughts on Dalvin Cook's performance here and now maybe with their new offensive coordinator wheels up possibly for the running game. Yeah, he he definitely looked good. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um you know, he was running hard. He was hitting his lanes. He was taking what was blocked and making more of it. So he looked great. Um, one thing that was a little bit quizzical um, for him was the lack of passing game work because he's been really good there this year. Um, he's been showing a lot out of the backfield in terms of pass catching. And so it was more of a low volume attack for them. It was only 21 pass attempts for Kirk Cousins. Um, and, you know, you would like to see more in the way of volume for, you know, those guys, if you're counting on Thielen or you're counting on digs. Um, so week one's got to have you a little bit concerned. Um, but you know, it's such a small sample size, obviously with only one game that, you know, I wouldn't get so worried about it. And so panic, you know, going to a panic mode, but it was a little concerning for Adam Thielen and digs. But, um, I was also concerned for cook because he needs those passing points. You know, he's not going to put up 168 yards on the ground every game. And, you know, you like to see him have that receiving work. And that was helping carry him throughout the beginning portion of the year. Yeah, I mean, aside from uh, Stephon Diggs, they weren't really doing much in the air. Uh, Even Adam Thielen had a horrible performance. But Cook did it on the ground, and he had a great great game. So So did Latavius, too. Latavius did score a touchdown. I saw that and he looked good. I mean, you know, that ground game is going to be solid now, especially, you know, if they got to go on the road and play outdoors. Um, I just love Latavius, right? Like this guy is going to be around the NFL for like the next five years. And we're he's going you know to make spot starts and that's fine. Like that's all he is. But you know what? He's darn good at it. If you're, if you're running back, going to go down. 
If I have Latavius right behind him, I'm happy. You mean love Tavius Murray? Yes, love Tavius. Love Tavius Murray. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, thoughts on uh, what about the offense now? I mean, Kevin Stefanski did some research on him real quick. And so he's been with the Vikings for 13 years. He came over from the Eagles uh, as an intern. And they've been, you know, grooming him. And Zimmer actually blocked him from going on interviews for uh, other coaching jobs. So they value him. When Scott Turner was uh, terminated, <laughs> when Turner was terminated in 27, uh, 2017, they uh, promoted him. And that was the year where uh, Case Keenum had a really great year for the Vikings. And he was the uh, quarterback's coach for the Vikings that year. So, yeah, I mean, the organization thinks well of him and, um, you know, putting up 41 points on Sunday uh, looked really good for him. So I'm definitely interested in seeing what the Vikings can do now with the uh, with the new offense. Yeah, and when you think back to that year, like you're saying, um, when he took over and Keenum was, you know, hyper-efficient, that's, you know, scheme. That's him, you know, scheming things open for his quarterbacks, making easy reads. And, you know, Kirk... For as gritty as he is, I actually really love Kirk Cousins. I do. I think he's overcome a lot for, you know, the way that Washington treated him and whatnot. He's not the between the ears quarterback that you'd want to see. You know, he doesn't always make the best decisions. He's got a little bit of that gunslinger mentality, except he can't make all the throws that he think he thinks he can. So to have a, um, you know, a coach who can scheme things, make easy reads, give you some free yardage in the middle of the field and, be able to move the sticks that way. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a good thing for Kirk Cousins, I think, to simplify the offense a little bit, take some of those decisions out of his hand, make things easier for him. I don't think it's going to be as low volume as it was this past week, so I'm not too concerned about it, but um, we will see. Maybe they do start to go to a low volume, and they actually make it more of a committee between Cook because you can't lean on Cook for, you know, 22-plus carries. It's just not going to happen, so... It might be a situation where Cook gets 16 and Latavius gets 12 moving forward or something like that. Not a true 50-50, but a 1A, 1B type of thing where they can kind of take some of the heat off Dalvin and maybe you know some of the heat off the passing game. Because really, when you think about Minnesota in the beginning of the year, it was just the Adam Thielen and Diggs show, right? So it was all passing through the air. And now Dalvin's back and healthy. Like They've got to find a way to utilize him and find a way to make Kirk more efficient. So this might be the perfect, perfect, perfect timing for this guy to move up to offensive coordinator. Yeah, especially, you know, down the stretch or in the playoffs where you're subject to playing outdoors and those kind of games with weather conditions, you're going to want to pound the rock. And, you know, let's face it too, you mentioned um, their their passing game with uh, Thielen and Diggs. It was just two weeks ago that Seattle was double covering both wide receivers, Diggs and, and um, Thielen, and they were putting a safety over the top for both wide receivers, so they were double covered. So it's going to be interesting now. I mean, we saw Cook have a great day if that's uh, what's what the recipe is going to be for Minnesota moving forward. But uh, moving forward for us, on the other side of the ball, Miami, the running game, the one and only Kalen Balaj, an NFL Max favorite and beloved prospect, Uh, It was his coming out party. Absolutely ridiculous. 12 carries, 123 yards, and a touchdown. And Balaj didn't even touch the ball until midway through the second quarter. So this guy put up 123 yards in two and a half quarters. Absolutely incredible. And, you know, me, I've got to scratch my head about Gase here. Adam Gase, who never played him. It took until a Frank Gore injury to give Balage uh, any kind of significant work here. And, um, you know, shame on him here for not getting Balage more involved uh, in the offense throughout the season and relying on a 35-year-old running back who looks absolutely pedestrian, who averages a 100-yard game per season, okay? And uh, his season's over. But Kalen Balage. Uh, it's an absolute party for him now and wheels up. You finally got to see what those metrics and that athleticism can do. And Nick, you know, you talked about him uh, in the preseason as being a cheat code. So again, let's, you know, what do you think here with Balaj? It's bittersweet, honestly. Uh, it's bittersweet only because 
you've come so far, right? Like, so we're sitting in week 15. Now we're going into week 16. Like you were so close to people forgetting about Kalen Balaj and him being a huge value in startup drafts. So that's like the bitter part. Um, but the sweet part, man, he is talented. The dude can play and you saw it on Sunday. That run was phenomenal. I mean, he planted cut and made a decision. And as soon as he turns up the field, boom, he's gone 75 yards. You can see the foot frequency. He's a big dude, but man, he can fly. So six his size. Two. Yeah. Six, his six two, 228 pounds. It's incredible. And the speed is there. Like it's, he's the most David Johnson type player since David Johnson. Like he is six foot two, 228 pounds. That's insane. And he can run as, as fast and he, he's quick. You can watch him plant. He's got some high knees. Like he runs well. And I think it's very, very telling the, the role that they put him into. Yeah. And that, that's the thing about Balaj is like with Gore and with Drake there, if, if either of those guys went down, he could fill either of those types of roles. Oh, yeah. So as soon as Gore goes down, he's he is now this two down back. And I think that Miami could view him as a three down. Like he is an excellent, excellent, excellent pass catcher. Mm-hmm. And anyone who didn't look into his profile from college, he was a distinguished pass catcher. That was like his role in college. Yep. So he can do that at the NFL level. So if you start to see this out of him and Miami actually believes he can run between the tackles and be a two down back, just imagine if they start to give him passing down work and he becomes a true three down back. It's like I was saying, a fantasy cheat code. I mean, there's there will be no way to stop this train. The only thing that's going to hinder him is this offensive line in Miami. Absolutely. He had 44 receptions in 2016 at Arizona State. And just taking a quick look at his metrics here, off the charts. Uh, like we said, 6'2", 228 pounds, runs a 4'4". I mean, the the height-adjusted speed score, based on his uh, height and weight, is top five percentile. And then you throw in the mix his three-cone, which is well above average, is 6.91. Um, it's just, it's ridiculous. It, he's a freak of nature. And, um, you know, listen, Gase had him on the roster. They drafted him. Um, but... I mean, come on. You couldn't get this kid more involved in the offense for the first 14, 15 weeks here. It's ridiculous. Um, and I was actually loving it, right? Like, it's like, that's what I'm saying. It's bittersweet. Like, had this happened in week eight, I would be stoked. But now that it's happening in week 15, yeah. I'm kind of bummed about it because he was going to fall out of the top, like, you know, 150. Yeah. If I could get a guy like Kalen Blige outside of, of the 150 overall, pit, I mean, that's that was a steal in my mind. I, I luckily right? I mean, just got like, him two weeks ago in, uh, in the NFL max league as a throw in. Uh, it's just, you know, I, that, that ship has sailed. You're not getting Bellagio's thrown anymore, but <laughs> um, yeah. Go, yeah. Go, and I mean, go. it's like, this is, this is kind of what you hope for at this point in the season, like over in Seattle. Yeah. Chris Carson, keep taking work, like let Penny fall. I'm not, I wasn't a huge fan of Penny coming out because people were paying the one Oh two for him. That was why I didn't like Penny because people were pay- paying the 102 and 103 over Geis, over Chubb, over Carry On. Like now that he's coming back down to earth, I saw a poll out there. I forget who ran it. Um, it wasn't Zachari- Zachary Zacharyson. It was uh, wasn't Whalen Nick Whalen. I can't remember who ran the poll, but I mean Penny has fallen to like the sixth or seventh overall running back in this class behind a guy like Philip Lindsay. Are you kidding me? I'd take Penny over Philip Lindsay any 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 day of the week. So yeah. let Chris Carson keep getting the work. Let Penny fall, and that's going to be value for you. I, that's what I was hoping would happen with Balage. I agree with that wholeheartedly, and I'm a Lindsay fan myself. But of course, you got to go with Rashad Penny in that pedigree. Uh, t- you know, a ton of these rookie running backs that are not playing or not playing well are falling, like Penny, um, Royce Fraudman, Ronald Jones, Freeman. Chris- Freeman will be a top target of mine this offseason. He has it written all over. He's gonna he's gonna want to come back and, and look quicker and sharper. Watch. Well, he's, he's gonna, gonna come back it. to camp and he's gonna be ready to roll. Let's see if he can. Uh for now, he's Royce Frodman. And then you've got Ronald Jones, who at this point, and listen, I don't even have Ronald Jones ranked in my top 10 rookies running backs, but if you can get him as a throw in, it's worth a shot. Um, Josh yeah, I think Adams. I think people will probably still have a little more allegiance to him than a throw-in. Um, but paid high for him. But shoot, coming up in startup season, no one has allegiance in a startup. 
there's no allegiance in a startup, right? So once the league is established and you pay the pick, then all of a sudden it's a different discussion. But if it's a startup, you're going to find him sitting there way, way late. And at that point, the stock is so beaten down, it's worth looking into. Yeah, I agree. Eventually, um, eventually they're going to see what they've got in the kid. Eventually. And it's so weird because they're pay- playing him like a pass catcher and we know he like he can't catch passes. That was like his big knock. Like he he can't catch passes, and that's how Tampa Bay is using him. It's quizzical. He can't. But, I mean, but let's not forget that one reception he had in the preseason. So just to close out on Belage, it was funny, you know, watching the game and you listen to the announcer, and in like the fourth quarter, obviously the game is pretty much over. Uh, the Vikings blowing him out. But the announcer is talking about how it's such a shame that Frank Gore left the game and they would have had a shot with Frank Gore. I mean, this kid just ripped off a 75-yard touchdown run. He has 100 and something yards on the ground off 12 carries. He's averaging like 10 yards a carry. And you're talking about Frank Gore leaving the game in the second quarter? I mean, it's... Well, Miami football is so brutal right now that even the announcer fell asleep during the game. (laughs) He must have. He he missed the whole... uh, All 128 yards. It's incredible. So that'll do it for that game. Moving on here. Chargers at Chiefs. Another game, and of course, you know, we got to talk about Damian Williams and uh, Spencer Ware not playing. But Damian Williams, for me, is just another example of the inept ability to scout players on your team by Adam Gase. I mean, we all praised, not we, so many people on podcasts and radio and television are just, we're just so in love with Adam Gase over the past couple of years. And I've got some serious questions for Adam Gase and some major, major doubts on his uh, talent evaluation. And he let a guy like Damian Williams walk when, to me, I mean, what he did for the Chiefs this past week was incredible. Um, so you want to talk about Damian Williams real quick? Uh, I could pull up his stats. I mean, we all watched the game. We all know what he did. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I talked about him last week. I said, like, you know, going back to his days in Miami from last year when he got the opportunity, um, you know, I actually liked him more than Drake. Like, I was more excited to watch him get onto the field um, in a Dolphins uniform than I was in Drake. And, you know, I'm still not sure I, I'm right about that. I think Drake is a better football player at this point. Um, but Damian Williams, man, he was special. And fresh legs and a good offense, it can make you look look very good. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think we should get caught up in the hype. I don't think you should go out and start drafting them high and start up drafts. But I do think, you know, there's there's a legitimate chance that this, you know, audition, so to speak, was a way for a stepping stone for him to get a role somewhere next year. It looks like he's going to be able to move on from Kansas City. Maybe they bring him back. If they do, I would venture to say it's, you know, more than a non-zero chance that he can enter week one is the starter. And if he moves on, then I don't see him being in in any worse position than a number two. So from my outlook, if you can get Damian Williams, you know, in the off season as a throw in to a deal, because now he's lost his appeal as the starter of the Kansas city chiefs. That's something that's worth looking into. Yeah. And you know, he does it all. He's, he's a better version of Spencer Ware. I know a lot of the community was very high on Spencer Ware because of what Ware did a few years ago, but we don't even know if he's like, if we'll ever be the same post injury. And I mean, Damian Williams is a great receiver. He had, he caught six balls for 74 yards and uh, he only ran for 50 uh, on the ground. But still, I mean, you saw what he can do in an offense that will use him in the passing game. And, you know, again, I, I'm going to just bring up Gase one more time. How can you let a guy like that walk? and opt to go with a 35-year-old Frank Gore as opposed to Damian Williams. And you could have had a sick running back uh, trio with uh, Damian Williams, Kalen Balazs, and um, Kenyon Drake. But nonetheless, uh, you know, I don't think uh, Gase will be the coach of the Dolphins next year anyway. So uh, that hype, that ship has sailed in my opinion. But yeah, Damian Williams looked really good with the with the Chiefs. I mean, do, do you think he's better than Spencer Ware? Because the hype on Spencer Ware was uh, was trending up uh, once uh, Hunt got pretty much ejected from the, the NFL. You know, I don't. I think Ware is, is a very much a professional running back. Like, I think he does everything well. He's not, 
you know, extraordinary in any one area. Um, but he does everything really well. He's able to pick up blitz coverages. He can get onto the inside. He can catch passes. So I really like where a lot. Um, I always thought he was a consummate pro. I think he's going to be around the league for, you know, quite a while still. Um, and I still think he's the better football player, but I think Damien's a, a nice compliment, right? So if you have these two guys, I'm not, I'm not worried about my running game. And, um, you know, even with the departure of Kareem Hunt, I don't see this with, if you have these two guys mixing in together and playing together as a two headed monster or one, a one B type thing. I don't see it being a huge drop off from Kareem Hunt, but I was never a huge Kareem Hunt fan anyway. So. Yeah, I wasn't a huge fan. I, I was a, a fan, um, but I do still prefer uh, Damian Williams from what I've seen in Miami and with the Chiefs over Spencer Ware. Um, he just hasn't looked like he did a few years ago, but hey, we'll see. I mean, Spencer Ware is supposed to come back this week, but we'll see. Uh, also in that game, Mike Williams, wide receiver of the Chargers. Uh, Keenan Allen broke your hearts that day with a with a goose egg. And if you had him on your roster, of course, you were starting Keenan Allen. I did in many leagues and um, suffered the consequences. But nonetheless, Mike Williams looked like an absolute man beast and dominated uh, nine targets, 76 yards, two touchdowns, and even ran in a touchdown for 19 yards, three touchdowns on a day all over the field. And it's he's the perfect complement to a Keenan Allen. And with a quarterback like Rivers, who's going to chuck it all day, uh, you've got to say he wheels up here for Mike Williams. And finally, we've got a Mike Williams that can play football and can play wide receiver. Uh, all these Mike Williams that have failed in the past, but thoughts on Mike Williams in that uh, charger offense. See, I'm going to temper the expectations just a tad. Um, you know, I, I do think he had a great game. I'm not going to take that away from him. I just think it's a tempered ceiling like when you think about all the the mouths to feed there you've got keenan allen he's gonna get his daily right like every game he's locked in for 10 to 12 plus targets he's gonna get his you gotta remember hunter henry's coming back wait true wait was didn't he play all year who hunter henry yeah, wasn't he like, didn't Stephen A say like he was like the man to watch or something? I'm also looking at the San Diego Chargers on offense, and I'm thinking about Hunter Henry and the way that he's played this year and as effective as he's been. He's going up against Derek Johnson. Yeah, Stephen A did say that. <laughs> um, but he's, here, right? <laughs> he's coming back, and you know he's he's a favorite target of Rivers when Rivers was down there, and that's where Mike, Mike Williams excels is in the red zone. Hunter Henry was... Rivers' favorite red zone target. So it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. I'm expecting it to take a little time for Hunter Henry to come back next year, shake the rust off. But I do think he's going to slide back into that number two role, which puts me um, at Mike Mike Williams being the number three option. And I think there's better ways to go. I know he's young. I know he's pedigreed. I just think it's such a tempered ceiling that at his price, especially if he's going to rise, because of this last game and maybe what he does this week and in week 17 and maybe even the playoffs if Keenan Allen's dinged up and can't go. Um, I just don't think it's going to be at a price point that I can make sense of. So that'll be it for the uh, Chiefs uh, Chargers game this past week. Um, another game in Chicago, Packers, Bears, uh, Aaron Jones breaking hearts and uh, leaving the game with an injury and the Packers put him on IR out for the rest of the year and in walks Jamal Williams and Jamal Williams had a nice day. Uh, me, myself, I'm not a big fan. Um, I loved Aaron Jones coming out of college and I preferred Aaron Jones to Jamal Williams. So as a Jamal Williams fan, uh, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about him in his performance this past week. Yeah, I'm definitely a, a fan of Jamal Williams. I just think he's more prototypical. I like the way he runs. He's, you know, physical runner, He's quick. He's got good movement for his size. And I think he's a, overall a good running back. I think he can catch out of the backfield. He's a better pass catcher than people give him credit for. Uh, he's he's good at picking up the blitz. And I think he's just the kind of guy who's just going to go to work day in and day out, not complain about his role. Um, I'm not a huge Aaron Jones fan. I don't, I, again, kind of like Tyreek, I don't think he's worthless. I just, for what people value him at, he's not someone that I'll probably have any shares of. I don't have any in other leagues and I pro probably won't have any coming out next year either. 
Um, just not a guy that I'm willing to pay up for at that price for that size. All of a sudden now we're two years in a row having an injury. So I don't know. He's just thin to me. I'm, I, I'm skeptical that he could hold up in the NFL, even if he were to stay the lead back. And lastly, in that game, uh, it was just nice to see Allen Robinson actually involved in the offense. Uh, Mitch Trubisky giving him a decent amount of targets on Sunday. He only had eight fantasy points in a PPR, but still, it was nice to see him out there and involved. So, you know, cross your fingers if you have to start Allen Robinson this week. Um, if you're dealing with some injuries, um, it's just it's a positive thing to see because he's been a massive disappointment in uh 2018 and i had a lot of shares of alan robinson but uh i don't know who to blame that on really i mean he's been injured he came back he looked fresh he looked good but i mean i guess there's just so many weapons in chicago now and um so that's the thing though i'm not even sure like the offense is productive but i think the i think the offense is being propped up by the defense like i don't think if the defense true. wasn't nearly as good i don't think we would be talking about them in the same light because when you think about their their fantasy assets right like raw yardage and things like that who is standing out like alan robinson's it's been coming. a massive disappointment it's anthony coming. miller i mean come on now like people were drafting him in the first round i this one it never made sense to me he's not doing anything trey burton's not doing anything jordan howard's not doing anything it's all funneling through cohen it's all funneling through cohen it's and it's job. crazy because everyone's like, oh, this Bears offense, it's alive. It's so good for the first time in years. I'm not sure it's that good. Like, it's a spread it around attack and it's effective and it's, you know, getting the job done. But I think they're being propped up significantly by the defense. I don't think the offense is as good as people are making it seem. I don't think Trubisky is as good as the stat lines might look. And, you know, he's, he's fine, especially as a fantasy quarterback because he rushes, he has a decent floor. I just, I don't think he's super talented. I don't see him as being a good quarterback and I haven't changed my tune on that. And I don't think I will. He still misses so many throws. He does. And he hasn't even thrown for 3000 yards yet. And you've got a boatload of quarterbacks that have gone over 3000 and 4,000 and Mitch Trubisky is at 2,814 passing yards. So like you said, he's going to make his due with those rushing yards for fantasy, but, um, I'm not really impressed with Mitchell Trubisky thus far. And, you know, in my opinion, I love Allen Robinson and I love Anthony Miller. So you've got two, in my opinion, two legit wide receivers and a freak of nature at running back in Tariq Cohen and Trey Burton's, a, a, you know, a decent receiving tight end. So he's got like weapons there. He should be throwing for more than, you know, sub 3,000 yards on, on the season now. So, what do you think about Shaheen coming back? I'm actually excited to watch Shaheen play and get back into this offense. I am too. And they were both in the same draft class. So you've got to think they've got some kind of chemistry going on. But Shaheen was an absolute freak at the combine. And I loved him as a prospect. So yeah, He was playing so well too before he got hurt. He was he really was. like, not only is he a great inline blocker, but he was really like, you could see the athleticism. You could see him stretching the seam. You could see he was going to be a playmaker for this team. And it was going to be interesting to see how him and Burton fit. And if Burton went into that Philly role where he was splitting out and playing a lot of the slot and being able to stretch the seam. Like, could you imagine the two of those guys running down the seam? Oh, if only they had a quarterback who could throw a pass and hit him. <laughs> well, he's six foot six. So you, I mean, if you can't, it's, hard to, sure it's you hard to miss, but it's possible. Yeah. He dominated in college. He's an absolute freak. And they took him in the second round. So, I mean, they've got to get him on the field, and they're going to use him. Oh, so, yeah. Historically, top 100 tight ends are not sure things to hit, but they're they're pretty close to as sure as you can get. And uh, he's a day two tight end, so he's pedigreed. So don't sleep on Adam Shaheen. At this point, people have forgotten about him. Startup value. Absolutely. Before we wrap up the show, a few players I wanted to touch on here. Um, wide receiver, Isaiah McKenzie. I know we briefly talked about him last week, but I went back and watched that, uh, Detroit Lions game. Unfortunately, I, I tortured myself, uh, for 30 minutes watching that game. It's an entirety, but McKenzie looks good and they got him all over the field. He's the starting slot wide receiver now for the bills. They promoted him a couple weeks ago doing kick re returns and, 
doing a little bit of this and that. And, uh, you know, he had a good day. And the rest of the way here, his matchups look nice for week 16. And you've got to imagine next year they address, Buffalo does, the wide receiver position. But I do like him as a slot wide receiver for next year um, and looking at his long-term uh, prognosis here. So any quick thoughts on McKenzie? I know you picked him up in a couple leagues. Yeah, I got him in a couple leagues, and I'm very thrilled with the pickup. It's the type of guy that you like to take a dart throw on, right? And uh, just like I was saying when we were talking about Mike Williams, I like to bake in variants, right? So Mike Williams is the type of guy who I don't see, you know, getting the upside that I, I'd like. Isaiah McKenzie is has high variance because he could probably put up a floor of zero, but he could also go and make any 70 yard pass into a touchdown. And like, that's what I'm looking at. I like that, especially if I'm churning the back end of my roster, I was very pleased to get him in a couple of spots. I think that that that's going to pay off. That's a good dart throw. And if it misses, it misses. I just cut him and I move on. Yeah. I mean, he was actually a fifth round draft pick in 2017 by the Broncos. And, you know, he's five, seven, a buck 73, which is a major red flag. But his BMI score isn't that bad, you know, being 5'7". But here's where he shines. He's a 4'4 four, four guy. I mean, obviously, if you're 5'7", you better be running a 4'4". Four, four. Uh, but top five elite three cone at 6'6'4". Six, six, so he's got great speed. He's got great agility, top five percentile agility. And he checks all those boxes. And he's well above average in all the other categories here, vert, broad, and 20-yard uh, dash. So... Athletic. Yeah, and I, I was going to mention when you watch him on the tape, you can see that three cone speed. Yeah. You can see him get off the line and you can see him create separation right from the first three steps. He's, he's fun to watch. So it just gives Josh Allen another uh, weapon to throw to there in Buffalo because God knows they need people to throw the ball to in uh, Buffalo. So like him as a prospect and I'm going to try to gobble him up as much as I can and get as many shares for next year. Yeah, Ryan McDowell posted uh, Josh Allen, the number one scoring quarterback over the past four weeks. Really? Yeah. Fake news. Not fake news. It's true news. <laughs> yeah, I, I texted you the other night when I was watching this game. Uh, he's slowly winning me over, Josh Allen is. And, um, you know, I was not a fan of his. But he, you know, he puts it together. I mean, it might look ugly, but... He's doing his thing, and um, you said last week he's uh, the better rushing rookie quarterback. Um, you know, a shot there at the uh, Lamar Jackson fans, but and I still can't believe you picked Josh Allen over Lamar Jackson in your other league. I, I I ended up going with Jackson. You did? Yeah, I did. I switched. My, I changed my mind. Okay, especially I'm in, I'm in the championship so. so. Yeah, and you know, speaking real quick about Lamar Jackson, I'm forced to start him. Uh, I have like five or six shares of him, but I'm forced to start him because I'm lacking a quarterback in most of my leagues, and Carson Wentz is out uh, the rest of the year in the max. But um, I was impressed. I mean, listen, he only put up 20 points last week against Tampa Bay, but the game was in the rain. It was an ugly game, but I was definitely impressed watching Lamar Jackson. And, um, man, he can flick it. He can throw it. He can run it. He can do it all. And um, this week, he's got a tough matchup against the Chargers. But um, you got to figure um, the running game is there for him. So we'll see what happens this week. That actually could be fake news on the uh, four weeks. On I, I saw it somewhere. It wasn't on McDowell, though. Yeah, that, that sounds So if, if I can't actually show it, then I'm going to call it fake news. Sorry, I lied to everybody. Hashtag fake news. Before we wrap up the show here, any thoughts on Tevin Coleman's performance? You know, I was such a huge fan of Tevin Coleman for the past few years. Loved him in college. And he just kind of broke my heart this year. With Freeman going down, didn't really take advantage of that opportunity he had. But, man, this week, I'm just pulling up the stats. Did you watch that game? Uh, I didn't. I did not get a chance to watch it, but I saw the stat line. He, yeah, he only had 11 carries, but he had 145 yards and a touchdown, and just demolished the Cardinals, who checked out of that game. But okay, you know, a couple weeks left here for Coleman to 
to do his thing and and show NFL teams what he can do because he will be a free agent entering the offseason. And oh, he, he's going to get paid too. He'll be the highest paid running back. There's no, oh, you think there's the highest no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind. Not in the league, but he'll be the highest paid this offseason for sure. Right. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, there's plenty of spots for him to go to, so he'll definitely have a job. Um, Maybe I take that back. Maybe Lev gets more. But outside of Le'Veon, he's definitely the highest paid. He's going to blow everybody out. He, he's going to get running back one money. And so as soon as he signs, if you have shares of Tevin, that's like the time to go shopping, right? Like go sell them off and see see where people go. Because if you can get something like a McKinnon price, what people were paying for McKinnon last year, cash <laughs> out. Oh, cash yeah. out. Speaking of cashing out, what about Derrick Henry? He did it again this week. I mean, man, I why couldn't he do this like three weeks ago? I would love to cash out on Derrick Henry right now. Are you cashing out or are you buying? Oh, I'm I'm gonna cash out. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely cashing out. I'm hoping, I'm praying he does this for the last two weeks. I'm praying they they actually treated him like the lead back this past week, right? So he was actually the starting running back for the Tennessee Titans. I, I said last week he is not the starting running back for the Tennessee Titans. And then, of course, what happens? Mm-hmm. He's the starting running back for the Tennessee Titans. So I'm praying that this happens for the next two weeks because I definitely want to cash out on Derek Henry. I'm done with it. Even if he ends up hitting and... You know, he becomes a solid RB two. I'd rather cash out and be done with it and be done with the headache and reset the clock. I agree. I mean, what's the ceiling for a guy like him? I mean, he's never going to catch any balls. So in a PPR, forty to seven points. Yeah, that's I, that's the ceiling. No, I'm talking about like on the year. You know, I know I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm being facetious. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And oh, what a story, though. I mean, like you're talking about a Heisman winning player an absolute phenom and you know he, he checks all the boxes like because i loved him as a prospect so he had a great college career he he had a combine and just killed the combine had an awesome combine gets drafted he's got the pedigree he's got the heisman he goes to tennessee where it looks like it's going to be the exotic smash mouth like everything was lined up for him the stars were aligned and he just couldn't do it and it's just amazing and you know I started to fall out of love with him and then watching him play in the NFL, he he didn't, he didn't look the same. Um, But the past few weeks he's making all his doubters look, look silly, but he's looked great. I mean, you know, you can't take that away from him and you know, if they're going to treat him like this, then he could be solid. And you know what? It's not something again. I feel like his price was coming, crashing, crashing, crashing down and I was going to be fine. Like I was going to be fine. I'd probably get some stock in startups again this year if he was going to continue to fall. But now with him rising back up, I want nothing to do with him. I'm going to cash out if I can in the places I do have him and see where that goes. I'm with you on that one. Um, so let's move on to the Max Mailbag uh, listener questions. You can submit your questions as well. Just email us at thenflmax at gmail.com. And we'll read your questions on air and try to answer as most as we can. We've got a couple here. Uh, one from Alex Fernandez, and he writes in and says, in a tight end premium dynasty league, 1.5 PPR, how high should you value that position? And is Travis Kelsey a first round option? So for me, every time I'm doing a startup with premium positions, I tend to value um, them higher. And obviously because they're a premium position, but I want to lock them in and I would like to corner the market if possible. Right. So for a super flex, a lot of the times it's all about finding the value in the quarterback. A lot of the times, once you're out of that first tier, there's not much separation. The same can be said with tight end, but there is such a tier difference at tight end with up top. You've got Kelsey and Kittle. Really? Those are my top two tight ends right now. And And that's a tier break for me. What's up? Don't forget Ertz. I'm I'm actually not putting Ertz in that first tier. That was that was purpose. That was wow. on purpose. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna probably head into the year with Kelsey and um, Kittle as my first tier and just be done with it. I think Ertz is gonna fall off a little bit. I don't necessarily um, have all the faith in the world that Philadelphia is gonna figure this out. I'm not sure that you know once 
can stay healthy. And if it's going to be foals or it's going to be back up, I think he might fall out of favor. Goddard's starting to come on. He can play and uh, we'll see what happens in Philly, but I'm there's too much uncertainty there for me to put Ertz in that tier one. I think Kittle locked into a solid offense, a Shanahan offense with Garoppolo coming back. And if Garoppolo goes down, you have Mullins who can sling the ball and obviously Kelsey in that, in that chiefs offense. I think those are a tier one for me. So, if I'm in a, in a premium format, I'm considering Travis Kelsey, maybe not in the first round, but early second for sure. So you wouldn't pay that top 12 pick for him? I don't know. It really depends. So like I just did a uh, ADP draft, so I'm going to go. It's it's not premium format, but um, I'm looking at the back end of the first round. Would I take him? I would take him over a guy like Antonio Brown. I wouldn't take him over any of the five running backs. So Saquon, Gurley, Elliott, Kamara, or McCaffrey, no go for me. Yeah. I'm not taking him over Beckham. I'm not taking him over Hopkins. I am probably going to take him over um, Antonio Brown. Mm-hmm. Probably but take him over Tyreek. That's tough. That's, that's, that's tough for me. I love Tyreek. Yeah. But, but I mean, I he's, so he is... He is going to be a bottom half of the first yeah, round bottom half of the player first. now that I'm looking at this list. I mean, you can make arguments in a premium format for him over guys like Michael Thomas, um, Melvin Gordon, Joe Mixon. I don't... Devontae Adams. I mean, yeah. He's he's probably a late first round tight end. Yeah. For sure in a premium format. At 1.5 points PPR. I mean, just imagine that extra half point when you're putting up 11 to 12 receptions as a tight end, yeah. that's an extra six points. That's, that's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, like you said, I mean, let's face it. The tight end position is absolutely putrid. If you didn't have Kelsey Ertz or Kittle this year, you were streaming all year and you were in trouble because the, the tight end position this year was terrible. It's one of the worst this year's in a long time, but uh, Kelsey for me, like, like we just said, late first round pick for me, early second in the startup. And the only red flag with Kelsey is his age, but I mean, he's what, 29 years old. Uh, but tight ends can play well into their thirties. We've seen Tony Gonzalez. We've seen these hall of fame type players, uh, play into their thirties. Um, but it, it is a position that is risk of injury. So you've got to be worried about that. You've got to be worried about the age. But in a tight end premium, like you said, you could secure that position and defensively take them off the board. You take those three tight ends off the board and everyone else is just, you know, going to be streaming the rest of the year for a while. Um, so, yeah, I'm going Kelsey, uh, bottom half the first. And uh, to answer the question, yes, he is a first round pick, but a late one. Okay, uh, so next question we got here from David Pando. What round... Should you start considering handcuffing your main running back in a 21 round dynasty startup league? So, you know, it's tough because it depends on what, what kind of league mates you're playing this game with. Uh, for a long time, I didn't really care about my backups, my backup running backs and handcuffing them. Um, I just let, you know, let teams gobble them off if they wanted them, but, um, it depends if you're most of the time when I'm doing a startup, um, I'm doing a productive struggle where all my roster spots are valuable to me for, uh, the long term, And I'm trying to get as many young players with high upside to just have as many darts as I can just to, to, to hit. And, um, I don't really want to waste the roster spot if I, if that's my strategy, on handcuffing and running back. But if you are going to compete right away and make that decision before the startup, then yeah, you're going to want to handcuff your running back. And if you have a playoff caliber team, you're definitely going to want to handcuff your running back uh, just to protect yourself going into the postseason for any injury. So um, that's, uh, that's my quick take on it. What do you think, Nick? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the backup running back only because I think they can pop off. Right. So not only is it handcuffing to me, it's it's going and getting the valuable handcuffs from other teams and snatching that value from them. So if they have a guy like Lev Bell and you were able to draft James Conner in a rookie draft, you had an immense amount of leverage on the league 
just from this year alone, right? So it was worth that third round, second, late second, early third round valuation in a rookie draft. From a startup perspective, when you get to the middle round, so I, I was just involved in a startup um, to generate some ADP. And, you know, I'm looking at the, the middle rounds, right? So you're looking at round nine and some of the wide receivers that are going around there. Uh, Devontae Parker, D.D. Westbrook, Zay Jones, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, um, Julian Edelman went late. I actually took him in round 11. Taewon Taylor goes, Deshaun Hamilton, uh, Dante Moncrief. This is the zone right here where it, things start to get ugly. It's a grab bag. So if I'm going to, if I'm thinking value, why am I going to take one of these guys who like a Dante Moncrief, who I'm hoping puts up seven or eight points when I can take a backup running back? Right, someone who, if Fournette were to go down, a guy like Yeldon can step in and take that role and put up a nice week, like pop for me, and in return, way more value, even if it's just one or two weeks than Moncrief could the entire season, scoring me six or seven points throughout the course of a season. There's just so much more value to be had with those late running backs in those rounds than piling up a bunch of crap at wide receiver where you're just praying and you have these decisions. Would I rather go six points or nine points on the week? It's just, it's not fun to make a lineup. And I don't feel confident rolling out a lineup like that. Well, but if you get a guy like Damian Williams or uh, yeah, like Damian Williams, even in the late rounds going into next year, if he doesn't have the starting role, but he's the backup running back from the chiefs. Are you going to feel comfortable plugging him in? Yeah. Heck yeah, I am, but I'm never going to feel comfortable plugging Dante Moncrief into my lineup. Well, more specifically, this particular league is a 21 round startup. So I'm assuming you're only able to roster 21 players. So now that kind of changes the game for me. Um, it doesn't change the game for me at all. And that's, that's the thing is like these, People think that it changes the game. They're going to want to take these upside risks on rookies. Let them go get the backup running backs. Because if you can pile them on in a 21 man league, I'm taking, I've, I have a league like this where it was only, it's only 22, 22 roster spots. All I did was take market share, market share, market share up top at wide receiver. I got drilled in my four wide receivers and I went all backup running backs. I went Chubb. I went carry on. I went, um, Penny, I had Yeldon, I had, I mean, everyone. And I was able to make it work throughout the course of the year. I came in first in my division and I ended up losing in the semis out of a, um, I think it was 12 team playoff or something. But I mean, just being able to generate the value from those, those running backs and then flipping them. That's where the key comes from. Yeah, I, I get it. The zero running back strategy is one I use often and it's my favorite of all of them. But I, I hate these leagues, though. These 20, 20 uh, roster spot leagues, 21 roster spots. I mean, give me 30, 35, 40. I mean, I want to develop players. I mean, maybe he's got a practice squad. Maybe there's like an eight to 10 man practice squad that he didn't say, but 20 man roster spots. Oh, I hate Yeah, it. I mean, I guess it's preference, right? So it's like how you want to run your league. So if you, the theory is like if you have shallow, shallow, um, roster spots, then people are hitting the waivers. You're staying active throughout the year because there's always value to be had. But I think the common, the common mistake with leagues of that size is that you, you give two two IR spots. So you start getting injuries and then you're all of a sudden you're making a choice between, do I go pick up someone from the waivers and release someone who should never be there because I don't have enough roster spots or do I just toss it toss in the towel for this year because I refuse to give up these players who are hurt. Yeah. And that's where I think the shallow leagues fall short is I think there should actually be more IR spots when you have a shallow league because you don't have the roster spots to churn for value at the bottom. Yeah, or practice squad spots. So I don't know. I hate those leagues. Final thoughts for me. I, just, uh, I guess we'll introduce a new segment called Don't Be That Guy. And I'll try to hit on this every week because I've been playing fantasy football for so long. I've seen so many characters in this crazy game and so many owners have come and gone in all my leagues. So uh, yeah, I can write a book on uh, the characters that I've seen play this game, but uh, don't be that guy. Uh, so this week, sportsmanship, you know, we're playing a game here. We're supposed to have fun. And if you're in these leagues uh, for long term, 
it's like a marriage. You're with, you're with these league mates 365, 24 seven in your group chats, whether you're using Voxer or Slack or whatever you're using, but we all want to win. But unfortunately, you know, 11 out of 12 lose. If you're in a 12 team league, you know, most of you guys are going to lose. So when you lose, congratulate the winner. I mean, he worked just as hard as you, hopefully. <laughs> uh, most of the times, if you're winning a league, you did your diligence and you did your job because getting into the playoffs, you know, you're doing your job just that alone. But have some sportsmanship. Congratulate your league mates. Uh, you know, the famous saying, I don't know who said it, but it's not if you win or lose, it's how you play the game. Um, play the game um, with some sportsmanship and, uh, congratulate your league mates because that could be you. Well, you know, when you win and eventually hopefully you will win one day, uh, you want your league mates to, to congratulate you and be happy for you. You know, you don't want to be that guy. So please don't be that guy. And uh, every week we'll be talking about, you know, that guy, because we all know who that guy is in our leagues. Every league has one, unfortunately, but uh, you don't want to kill the vibe of the league and you don't want to be that guy. So that'll be it for the show. Um, just wanted to thank everybody out there. Thank you for subscribing and, um, thank you for listening. Uh, we appreciate it. You can contact the show. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. You can find the league on Twitter at NFL max. You can find Nick on Twitter, um, at hot pineapples FF. And you can find me at Ewok juggernaut. And if you're watching us on YouTube, like I said before, check us out on iTunes, subscribe, Search for us, NFL Max, on iTunes. And um, we're giving away T-shirts this week. And next week, uh, if you subscribe to us on iTunes and you give us a five-star review, I will ship out to you guys for free a T-shirt. Um, just hit me up on either Twitter or email me, thenflmax at gmail.com, and we will get you guys a free T-shirt for the five-star review. So we greatly appreciate it. Um, and just wanted to thank everybody out there for, for listening and watching us every week. So we'll keep pumping up stuff for you guys every week. And we'll be back next week post championship week. And we've got plenty in store for the, uh, post season. So for the hot pineapples, you are juggernauts here. Everybody one clap. Thanks guys. See you. Like Gurley and Saquon are in such a tier of their own. If you don't get the 101 and 102, it sucks. I'm interested to see how people approach fantasy because for me, it's like I, I love the upside. Yeah. Balazs looks so good. away and thinking that you know he can do some things i'm keeping my eyes i'm keeping my eyes on this matchup right here spencer you got your linebacker. i'm sorry spencer where is out oh yes 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 i forgot i'm sorry out max i'm foot. sorry yeah. yeah absolutely he is out adam gase like i don't trust do you trust adam gase no not at all not so at like all. this could be a huge trap game where we saw balage we're all in love and then he pulls the rug from underneath us and gives Drake. Yeah, but carries. No, Jamal Williams. Oh, forget. Oh, Jamal Williams. Jamal. Oh, get from it. Green Bay. Oh, that's a tragedy. Yeah, it's a tragedy. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, he's probably like Nick's gonna bid fifty bucks on Balage. He was probably kicking himself when he woke up this morning. Oh. I left Balage out there just to see, like, just to be like, I wonder what's oh. gonna happen here. So I hope you put a bid in for Balage now. Oh, I picked him up for free now. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me! Yeah, I got my Christmas lights. I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss the Christmas tree now. <laughs> All right, hang on. Is that in Oklahoma State? Oh yeah. You know who this is? The one. Oh, it's Barry. Yeah. Twenty-one, like, baby. What in the world? <laughs> I didn't realize you were such an Oklahoma State fan, but that makes sense. No, I'm not. I'm only a Barry fan. We got a Benji Max Bowl. We got a Benji uh, Juggy Max Bowl here. Yeah, I'm pretty uh, pretty happy about that. Yeah. It'll be a good one. It'll be good. My wife listens to me talk about it, but she has no idea what I'm saying, so she just <laughs> smiles and nods. <laughs> but she's a trooper. 
Hey, I don't think my girlfriend knows what we're talking about either. But I know. I can't believe she watches the show. That's, that's like extreme dedication. She says she's bored at work and um, it helps pass the time. Didn't, didn't Burkhead get the start this week? Did he? Oh my God. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Burkhead got the start this week. Next week it'll be Cordero Patterson. Exactly. <laughs> if this ends up costing me the championship, then so be it. Whoa. I guess you heard the that. What was that? Uh, yeah, I heard that. It was awful. So, yeah. So, my girlfriend, I told you she watches the outtakes every every episode. Yeah. And uh, she was like, I'll give you guys a five-star review and uh, review the show. But you've got to publicly apologize for what you said. And I was like, what did I say? She's like, you said that I only watched the outtakes, and that's not true. I watched the whole show. So, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. My public apology uh, to my girlfriend, uh, she does watch the show, and I can see on YouTube statistics if uh, people are watching the show in its entirety or just like five minutes. But, uh, yeah, she does watch the show, the full 45 to 60 minutes of the show. 